morning, everyone, uh, from very early New York City. Uh, it's such a treat and a thrill to be with you. Uh, this Warwick Summit has a storied reputation and draws some very interesting minds, which is why I set the alarm this morning, because I couldn't wait to talk to both of these people uh, who I've admired uh, from afar and is so great to meet virtually. Uh, our first guest, Professor Yuval Noah Harari, historian, philosopher, best-selling author, of course, of Sapiens, and a brief history of, of, of humankind, Homo Deus, the follow-up to that, a brief history of tomorrow, and 21 lessons for the 21st century. They've held positions number one to three, I think, on the Times, Sunday Times bestseller list for something like 96 consecutive weeks. Uh, his books have sold over 35 million uh, copies in 65 languages. And uh, I've been quoting Sapien since, since the day it came out. He has a new uh, endeavor called Sapien Ship, which manages uh, his media as well as other sort of multimedia presentations, uh, which sounds very exciting. So Professor Yuval Noah Harari, welcome. Great to see you, sir. Thank you, it's good to be here. And our other guest this morning, Vanessa Nakate, is a climate activist from Uganda and the founder of the African-based Rise Up movement. As she began striking uh, in Kampala in front of the parliament there in January of 2019 after witnessing droughts and flooding uh, devastate communities in her home country and seeing, of course, the work of, of Greta Thunberg. She now campaigns particularly internationally to highlight the impacts of climate change, how it's already playing out in Africa. She focuses particularly on how the climate crisis is exacerbating poverty and conflict and gender equality, as well as promoting a key climate solution and educating girls. She's been at high level events uh, around the globe, including uh, the World Economic Forum 2020, named the BBC's one of 100 most, uh, 100 most influential women of the year, as well as one of the 100 most influential young Africans. Vanessa, great to meet you uh, as well as a, as a Twitter follower. Good morning. Yeah, thank you, good morning. Um, before we get, get rolling, I'd actually like Professor Herardis to sort of set us off on an, on an optimistic note. Uh, when you live in this beat, <laughs> it's easy uh, to, to get really depressed most days. Yes. Uh, when we, since as you have taught us, Professor Hari, that we're all made of stories. Uh, they form our borders and our currencies and our flags and our corporations. And the story that we're living through now is as seismic as any in, in human history, I think. But you like to start off with an optimistic note uh, when it comes to the cost of yeah. really meaningful solutions. So could you explain sort of your 2% solution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know, in, in, in recent years, too many people have switched very quickly from uh, denial to despair, from dismissing climate change or not giving it enough importance to feeling that, oh, it's too late. The end of the world or the end of civilization is coming and it's too late to do something about it. And actually, when you read the reports, different reports of experts from various fields, and you ask, what is the price tag of stopping catastrophic climate change? It's surprisingly moderate. Uh, it's estimated by different panels and experts at about an additional 2% of global annual GDP, uh, the, the uh, gross domestic product of the, of the entire world, of the whole of humanity, if we invest an additional 2% of that every year in the right places, we can prevent catastrophic climate change. Now, 2% of global GDP is still a lot of money, but the key message is that it is a feasible political project. Politicians are actually quite good at shifting 2% of resources from here to there. When there is a war to fight, they spend much more. Um, and uh, you, know, you don't need to completely dismantle the economic system. You don't need to completely overhaul the political system. We just need to get our priorities right. We don't have a lot of time to do it. We need to do it now, but we have the resources. There is no reason to succumb to despair. Vanessa, what do you think when you hear those words? I'm interested in your origin story. What, what inspired you to go sit on a solo strike in Kampala there, uh, but also what you've learned since you've been doing this, the highs and the lows, the interactions and, 
And do you take hope from, from those numbers that the professor throws out? Yes, I, I do agree with Professor Harari that there is need to change priorities because the resources are available you know, to give us a sustainable future. It's mm. all about priorities. If there is political will, then the change that people are demanding for is actually possible. So in 2018, that is when my journey of activism started. It was towards the end of the year when I started to carry out research about the challenges that the people in my country, Uganda, were facing. And at that point, I got to understand that climate change was one of those challenges and actually the greatest threat facing the lives of so many people at that time and even right now. In school, we all knew climate change being the changes in weather, you know, weather conditions over a long period of time, but we didn't know about the reality you know, of the climate crisis. We didn't have you know, that experience of you know, feeling like this was something that was happening right now and affecting people's lives right now. So digging more into the subject and reading more about it, I got to learn about some of the impacts of the climate crisis. And some of these impacts were already evident in my country. For example, the floods, you know, in the western part of the country, the landslides in the Mount Elgon area of, you know, the country, these are things that were already evident. And at that point, I decided that I had to do something about it. I had to use my voice to demand for climate justice and being inspired, you know, by Greta Thunberg from Sweden to start the climate strikes. I also founded the climate strikes in my country, Uganda. And it has been, you know, a journey of striking every Friday, organizing and mobilizing in schools and carrying out, you know, climate education and reaching out to as many, you know, communities as possible to communicate the crisis, but not just the crisis, to also communicate the power of the people in driving change. And it has also been a journey of meeting so many different people, especially young activists and learning from them and learning from their experiences and the work that they're doing in their countries. I know that you have a business degree, but you've also been pretty critical about capitalism as it exists today, uh, as a driving force on a lot of these problems that we're facing, unintended consequences or not. Um, what do you think are the biggest systemic barriers to meaningful change? Yeah, I think, you know, I think one of those things is the lack of awareness uh, among different people. I can give an example, you know, when I was in, you know, in Glasgow for the climate strikes and also, you know, for the COP26, you know, there was some, you know, there was some news in my country and there were some follow-up comments from different people saying that, you know, we as activists, we were exaggerating the climate crisis. So I think also, you know, the lack of awareness among the public is also a very huge problem in us achieving change. Because if we do not have support, you know, from, from the different people, especially in our communities, it makes even our work harder to demand for climate justice. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we need as many climate activists as possible from different parts of the world to rise up because I know that there is so much power in the people, you know, to drive change and bring about sustainable, um, you know, sustainable futures. And I think the other thing is about um, the priorities, like, you know, Professor Arari talked about, it is the, the political will. If there is no political will, you know, to give us real systemic change for a more climate friendly, you know, wow, then it, it may be hard for us to ever see, you know, the changes because as activists, we will organize in our communities, we will organize on the streets, we will protest, but then the decision lies in the leaders. You know, they are the ones who make this, the, the signings, they're the ones who decide on the policies. So there is, there is a huge responsibility on the leaders to have, you know, a political will that will ensure that the future and the people are protected. And I also think the other thing comes really through media. Media also has a huge responsibility in highlighting and amplifying um, you know, the different voices, the different people. Because uh, the other thing we see is that for many people in the global north, as we all you know, fight for uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius to 
many people in the global north 1.5 is like the survival point but then when you get to listen to someone maybe you know from an african country you get to realize that even at 1.2 degrees the climate crisis is already affecting so many people so i think there is a huge you know responsibility for media to really amplify the voices of activists of communities from the most affected areas because we are facing the climate crisis and the leaders need to understand the urgency not for them to feel like we are you know we are still okay as long as we get we keep it under 1.5 everything is okay but even at 1.2, it isn't okay. And you can only get that, you know, from the stories of the people that are on the front lines of the crisis. Absolutely. You, you remind us that this is the, the most unjust crisis. It's so unfair. It, it punishes the young uh, for the sins of the old. It punishes the poor for the sins of the rich. It's the, the analogy I heard that I really stuck with me. It's as if the people in the Western world were smoking a carton of cigarettes a day and living long, happy lives, but people in say Bangladesh or Uganda were getting lung cancer at, at you know, uncommensurate rates. But Pro Professor Harari, um, how do we change that story? The way that the, the system is set up now is you don't get elected to a, at least a, a, a political office or to a board of directors seat by saying, we need to slow down growth. We need to temper. Mm -hmm. Uh, this, you know, rampant focus on GDP or quarterly statements. You've written, it really struck with me that humans have the free will to do what they desire, but they can't change what they desire. They can do it, but they can't change what it is they're after. And doesn't this crisis demand that we change hmm. what human beings uh, desire? And, and can stories, do they have the power to change that so dramatically hmm. in the amount of time we have? No, we don't need to change the fundamental things that we desire. We need to change the way that we go about achieving them. Uh, people desire, I don't know, peace of mind, to, to be peaceful inside yourself. This is something almost everybody wants. So, you know, you listen to the commercials on television and you get this idea that if I want peace of mind, I need to fly to the other side of the world to some idyllic island and spend lots of money and create enormous amounts of pollution in the process in order to get peace of mind. And this is just nonsense. I mean, you don't need to change your basic desire to have peace, but you can achieve it right here. You don't need to fly to the other side of the world. And similarly, people want to be loved and they want to love, but it doesn't really cost so much money. You don't need this you know, entire industries that are supposed to make you more attractive or whatever, in order to have love in your life, um, you can achieve it much more cheaply and uh, in, in a much more healthy way for you and the environment. So the basic desires of human beings, yes, it's very difficult to change them and we don't need to change them. We need to change the extremely roundabout and sometimes ridiculous way that we go about pursuing these fundamental human needs and, and human desires. And this is, again, it's, it's, it's really about the stories that we believe and that, and that we tell ourselves. And um, yes, I mean, if you go to the level of politics, so for instance, to be elected for office, if uh, guilt is not something that will get you elected, if you think about the, the, the rich and powerful countries, which are really responsible for this crisis, as a politician, if you go around and basically telling people you're guilty for this, uh, it's true, but it probably won't get you elected. Uh, powerful people, they don't like guilt. Maybe just a little bit of it, but not a lot. Yeah. Um, so we have to be wise about the way that we frame this. Um, and we need to find ways, uh, again, you mentioned the, 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 the kind of imperative for economic growth. There is no necessary contradiction between a greener and clean, cleaner economy and growth. We can, to some extent, over the long run, achieve both. When we talk about investing, 
in cleaner and better infrastructure, technology, and so forth. It's not like we take all this money and make a huge bonfire as a sacrifice to the spirits of, this, of the earth. No, you invest the money in new technologies, in better infrastructure, in project, ecological projects, like the, the, the Green Wall of the Sahel. And this not only helps the environment, over the long run, it also actually creates jobs and creates economic prosperity. So this kind of binary thinking that there is a necessary clash between the economy and the environment and you have to choose, if we think like that, it's going to be very difficult. We need to find ways to, uh, uh, in a way, combine the two and have policies that, yes, in the immediate term, it will have economic difficulties. We have to be honest about it. But in the long run, it doesn't mean that we have to give up modern civilization or we have to give up modern technology. We can find ways to just do it better. Vanessa, do you, when it comes to your activism, it sounds to me like you think just getting the message out is hugely important, that there's not enough awareness. But what, do you, what have you found to be the most effective? Is it using guilt against uh, a leader these days? Although it seems that there are more and more world leaders are impervious to guilt. Uh, they miss that gene somehow. But what, what, what carrots, what sticks, what motivators, what do you think is, is worth uh, an activist time? And what do you think is a waste of time? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that I've seen in my activism journey has been speaking truth to power. And I think that is something that um, can really like help us a lot in you know achieving a more sustainable world. Because what is truth when we are you know speaking in activism? It is telling the real stories like it is. Because you know, when you find or when I find myself in places whereby, you know, an example I've already given, if I find myself in places, you know, where people are saying 1.5 is our survival. I will speak the truth of what is happening on the ground, that for us, 1.5 is not actually the survival, because even below 1.5, people are already suffering some of the worst impacts of the climate crisis. When I'm in a place and people are, for example, talking about uh, electric vehicles, you know, for sustainability, I will speak the truth that I see that many communities where the, the, the materials needed for the manufacturing or the making of these vehicles, many women have to go through violence. Many children experience child labor in many, you know, in the parts where the mineral needed to make an electric vehicle um, is made. So that when everyone is saying electric vehicles, it is our way to, you know, sustainability. You speak the truth you know, beyond that, beyond the electric vehicle, who is being impacted by it and who is benefiting from it? If I'm in a place and, you know, a corporation is talking about a tree planting campaign, you speak the truth of how corporations are, you know, exploiting and grabbing lands of indigenous who can plant trees and make that tree planting campaigns, you know, possible. So I think one of the things that is really important, you know, in the movement is to keep speaking truth to power because again they will keep saying how the climate crisis is here but then many people will not understand the urgency until you speak about you know how climate change is around, is is exacerbating poverty you know in different parts of the african continent you keep speaking about how it's exacerbating gender inequality or how it's making peace building efforts impossible, you know, in some parts of the world as people battle for the, the limited resources as, you know, water, for example, as water sources dry up, they become limited. So communities battle for those limited resources. So I think it's really about speaking the truth to power when it comes to the agency to talk about what is really happening on the ground and not what people think or imagine is happening because climate change is more than weather. You know, it's more than statistics, it's about the people. And when it comes to solutions, like I've said, people will always talk about climate solutions. 
but then you not and speak the truth about some of the solutions, who is benefiting from them and who is being harmed by what we all call climate solutions. Because in the end, everything that is being proposed as climate solution is actually not climate justice. If we are to have climate justice, that means the planet is okay and also the people are okay. I think that, you know, I think to me, it's about keep, to keep speaking truth to power in, you know, climate spaces and conversations. Yeah, especially since we, we live in sort of the golden age of greenwashing. It is good for a brand to say the right things uh, or good for a politician in some places, but saying and doing are, are two different things if, as we found out. Uh, Professor Harari, I'm, I'm wondering, as you study how the way humans organize themselves over time, of, mm -hmm. of all the governments that, that have been tried up till now, what kinds do you think are the best and the worst equipped to, to deal with a problem uh, like climate change? And who do you see like leading this mission? Is, is America's cold civil war, how, how much doom does that spell for the rest of the planet as just a, a massive consumer and producer? Uh, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the geopolitical aspect of this story? Well, the, the worst governments are those that focus on the uh, uh, protecting the interests of a single person, uh, an autocratic dictator, or a very small clique around that person, and certainly don't care about humanity as a whole, but even don't really care about the nation. They may speak the language of patriotism and nationalism, but they actually are in the service of just one person or a very small group. Whereas the best governments are those that represent the broadest uh, uh, um, number of, of, of people and variety and diversity of, of viewpoints. Uh, they're usually also more concerned about the global situation because they realize that uh, as we just heard, the, everything is, is connected and you advance uh, one particular solution, you need to see how it impacts people in other places in their, actual, uh, in their actual lives. So this is where I would draw the kind of, of, of line. Um, certainly what's happening in the US is not helpful because it is the, still the biggest economic and political power on earth. And it used to be a global leader on many things. And it's now basically abdicated. It's a, a global leadership role. And nobody's really stepping up to fill that vacuum. And um, yeah, we don't really need a single country to be the leader. Ideally, uh, many countries, many organizations on the grassroots level should each be contributing their ideas, their motivation towards a common project. But yeah, I mean, in the end, to, it, it's a global problem that can only be solved through global cooperation. And to have this kind of cooperation, you need leadership. And it's, it's very unfortunate that at the present moment, we don't have it. We don't have it even on a, on a far more immediate crisis like COVID, we haven't really seen much global leadership on that, it's going to be even much more difficult with climate change. I think that I keep coming back to the idea that the COVID pandemic is really a, a dress rehearsal on a much smaller level for the, for the climate crisis and a reminder about how communities that are, have trust and faith in science and each other sort of suffer the least and those who wait for those citizens to start dying suffer the most. But at the same time, it, we're still so divided globally, you know, within <laughs> countries about these sorts of things. And there's a lot of hope that if governments can't pull it together, that maybe it'll be corporations like benevolent capitalism. Uh, mm. Professor, what are, your, what are your hopes for that? You write a lot about technology. I, I look at, you know, some of our brightest minds spending their days working on cryptocurrencies and NFTs and space tourism instead of like planet saving innovations, not to judge anybody's career choice. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you have hope that ultimately the, the, the new ideas, the new technologies will, will be more solutions than distractions? Well, first of all, it should be clear that the, the role of, of, of leadership and making policy should be firmly in the hand of politicians, not in the hand of uh, uh, corporations or even in the hands of scientists. 
uh, private businesses and also scholars, they don't represent the public. They have their jobs, which are important, but ultimately it's politicians who are supposed to represent the interests of, of, of humans, and they should, should be the one who are leading. Uh, with regard to technology, uh, and it, 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 technology is obviously the key. It created the problem in the first place. It's also a key to the solution. But by itself, technology is never a solution because every technology can be used for, for good or for ill. Uh, it depends on, on how you do it, on uh, which interests you take into account. So yes, we need people to work on, on, on the technological aspects, but we need the politicians to direct it in the right way for the benefit of the greatest number of, of people and of the entire ecosystem. And, um, you know, one of the biggest dangers in the technological utopianism that, oh, the technology will solve it, is the kind of uh, Noah Ark syndrome, mm -hmm. like in the Bible with the flood, that yes, eventually they built an ark, but just for five people or something like that. Right. Almost everybody drowned. And there is a very big danger that with climate change, when people talk about what our future is going to be like, there is no us, there is no our future. Humanity might divide into a majority maybe of people who would suffer tremendously and a minority that will have the resources, the wealth, the technology to protect themselves and even flourish in some kind of technological Noah's Ark. And this is extremely dangerous. Again, I think one of the reasons that we don't see enough urgency from leaders, from business elites and so forth is that in the back of their mind, they are counting on a technological Noah's Ark. And that's very, very dangerous. Vanessa, I know that you uh, focused a lot on loss and damage trying to get countries that had contributed very little uh, to the problem, some support from the richer countries that have sort of created the mess. Mm. Uh, what has that been like? What have been your successes and, and, and roadblocks to getting people to do the right thing uh, on a global scale? Well, yeah, we, we all understand that loss and damage is something that is already happening right now in so many vulnerable countries. And there was so much conversation and work being done to ensure that loss and damage is put on the agenda, especially at the COP26. But then we saw that, you know, there's no separate fund that was put in place specifically for loss and damage. And yet so many um, communities are already suffering loss and damage. And this is something that I have said, you know, multiple times that we, you know, loss and damage as it affects so many communities, you know, people end up losing things that they cannot adapt to, you know, people cannot adapt to starvation. You saw the Eastern Africa drought that left over 26 million people with no access to food, with no access to water. So how can people adapt to starvation? How can people adapt to loss of lives because of some of, you know, because of some of these disasters? As loss and damage continues to happen, people's cultures are being lost, people's histories are being lost. So, and these again are things that people cannot adapt to. So it's really important that loss and damage is not only put on the agenda, but also a separate fund, you know, to be put in place specifically for loss and damage, because in the end, without, you know, this fund for loss and damage, then there is no lifeline for so many people who are already losing things that they cannot adapt to. We know that adaptation and mitigation is important, you know, but even the climate finance of $100 billion that was promised, it is yet to be delivered. It hasn't been delivered. And the countries on the front lines of the climate crisis are still waiting, you know, for, the, for this climate finance to be delivered. So to me, you know, in this, this year, as COP27 is going to be in Egypt, 
it's really important that you know many people rise up together and especially uh, the governments in Africa, African leaders, you know, to unite together to put a demand, you know, as we as we go to COP27, to put a serious demand on climate finance for adaptation, mitigation, and loss and damage, a separate fund for loss and damage, because we can't do it by ourselves. Many times as activists, we are asked for, you know, solutions. What can we do to make sure that, you know, the funding is got for loss and damage, but we can't do this alone. We need the support of you know leaders to come together, to unite together, and really place these demands as vulnerable. You know the people on the front lines to put those demands on the global north because we know who caused the climate crisis and we know who needs to pay. So it's important that the people who are responsible for climate change show us the money for adaptation, for mitigation, but also for loss and damage. Professor, as you said, the COP process, it took 26 of these conference of parties for them to even utter the word coal as a driving force of, of a dirty energy. Um, you know, given the, all the various special interests coming at this problem from all different corners of the world, what do you how would you characterize the effectiveness of these of these global uh, conversations as to getting us to the to the ultimate end hmm. well things are moving in the right direction but far too slowly uh as things look right now the the uh, uh looking to the future it, it looks grim that we are not doing enough we are not it doesn't seem that we will be doing enough on on time Again, the, 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 I, I can't predict the future. What I can say when looking at the present is that we have the resources to solve it, but we are not doing the right things. And um, I hope, you know, and the, the most tragic things in history are not the unavoidable disasters. The, mo the biggest tragedies are the disasters that could have been prevented. So we are living right now in the midst of one, the COVID crisis around the world, which, you know, compared to previous pandemics in history, the Black Death was an unavoidable disaster. Humanity did not have the scientific knowledge and the technological power to understand and prevent or stop the Black Death. COVID-19, in contrast, we did have, we still have, the scientific knowledge and the power to stop it, and we are not doing it. So it's a much bigger tragedy in this sense. And it's the same with climate change, that we can prevent it, but we are not doing it. And this is extremely unfortunate. Yeah, I have a question here from one of uh, the audience, Rudoshi, following up on, on the COP 26, 27 idea for Vanessa. Um, do you think keeping 1.5 alive is achievable given what's the progress that's happened at, at these latest COPs? Well, um, I'll first say that we've had 26 COPs and even with 26 COPs, the climate crisis has continued to escalate and people have continued to be impacted by this crisis. But also following on what Professor Harari has said, we have the resources to actually stop the climate crisis. So meaning 1.5 is actually achievable if there is the will of governments, you know, to make this happen. And not just, you know, to commit to making it happen, but to actually make it happen. Because every COP, there are always commitments, there are always promises, there are always pledges. But then commitments will not stop the warming of the planet. You know, pledges will not stop the suffering of the people. And promises will not stop emissions from rising. What will stop, you know, the climate crisis will be real action starting right now. So it is achievable if there is political will to do so. This is uh, a question. Maybe, uh, oh, please, maybe I'll, I'll just add to that, that, um, you know, sometimes I hear people say that, no, it's, you know, it's, it's a very long term project and it's kind of complicated with all these statistics. 
people can't unite be behind this kind of, of, of long-term project. Uh, certainly when you look at elections in, in, in democratic countries. And it's not true. People can unite around long-term projects, even based on all kinds of complicated statistics. To give one counter example, uh, if you look at the rise of populist and ultra-nationalist parties in different parts of the world, what often what they tell people often is a long-term story about uh, uh, um, demographics. They frighten people with all kinds, all kinds of fantasies that you will be replaced in a couple of decades, you will be replaced by immigrants and foreigners and so forth. And even though this is probably not true, and even though it's a long-term prospect, it's not put tomorrow, it's in 40 years or 50 years, and even though it's based on complicated demographics, it's powerful enough to uh, catapult all kinds of uh, ultra-nationalists and populists to power. So, you know, I don't like these kinds of politics, but there is one lesson we can learn from them that you can mobilize people mm -hmm. around a long-term hazy uh, 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 project in order to make a drastic change in politics. So it's not impossible. I'd like that, that, that harnessing that power for, for a more benevolent purpose to get people worried about the future in that way. It's interesting. Um, Milenia uh, or Milena wrote in, she, she touched on your article of the surprising low price tag mm -hmm. uh, professor. And she's wondering what can we as young students, future leaders do right now to encourage these sorts of investments to happen right now? And this is really a question I think for both of you, just when people ask, what can I do? What do you tell them, Vanessa? What do you what do you say, Professor, when people want a sense of agency, but the problem seems too big uh, for, for any one person to bear? Um, well, I mean, I, I think I, I'll, I'll give two pieces of advice. First of all, join an organization. And secondly, focus on a particular concrete issue. Mm. Uh, single individuals working in isolation, it's very difficult to achieve anything. But even if just 50 people join together to an organization, they have enormous power. This is the superpower of humanity, organizations. So 50 people working together have a lot more power than 5,000 people, each working in, in isolation as an individual. Uh, and secondly, you know, if you look at the, at the, at the big picture, then you feel as an, if you're not the leader of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a country, then you feel hopeless. What can I do about the planet? Don't worry about the entire planet. Find one thing which maybe is close to your heart and which you have the knowledge or the ability to actually affect and focus on that. And if enough people do these two things, focusing on particular projects, and, you, and, and joining organizations in order to, to make a difference, I think we, it, it, we, we can still prevent catastrophic climate change. Vanessa, do you, how has the pandemic affected your activism work and the inability to get big marches together in the streets the way you used to? And, and what do you tell young people or people of any age really who say, what can I do? Well, um... Of course, I get that question so many times, especially because uh, we reach out to communities and also, you know, to students in schools. And, you know, recently, that is, I think this week, I was at a school with fellow activists and we were speaking to different students uh, of different grades. And there's, uh, I think, they were around seven to nine years. And there's a group of around seven to nine years. And they were asking us what they can also do you know, for the environment. And I remember asking if they all had, you know, water bottles, you know, that they carry to school. And they all said, yeah, they do. And I told them that is something that they're already doing at a very young age, because because of that water bottle, they don't have to use a plastic bottle and they end up protecting, you know, uh, a marine species somewhere in the lake where many of those plastics, you know, end up. So 
this is for you know someone who is like seven years eight years nine years who wants to do something because i know that as you know a very young person or as a child you you don't need to know about you know the complex issues of you know the climate but it is just those small things that a young a young person can start with and as they grow in knowledge and wisdom about these issues they start to expand more on what they want to do and then you know for the for the older older people uh, like you know professor harari has talked about you know finding that one thing you know, it's important for people, for people to know that we are like in a system and that system, everything is interconnected. So if one part of the system, you know, is not okay, or if one part of the system is damaged, then eventually, you know, the whole system will crash down. So when you find that one piece in the system, that one thing in the system that you want to focus on, you're actually benefiting the whole system. Mm. So I think that is another thing that, you know, people can do. Just find something that you feel, you know, you can do and something that you feel you can educate, you know, yourself about through articles or through, you know, uh, short online courses to learn more about it. Um, you know that you're not just doing that one thing, but you're actually benefiting the system. You know, like if it's a puzzle, you just get that one piece of the puzzle. When we all put those pieces together, we eventually realize that the puzzle is actually full. So you just find that one thing, you know, that you can focus on. It, it can actually transform so many people's lives. And then um, for the pandemic, of course, when the pandemic started in my country, you know, we may not do strikes like the rest of, you know, the people do them maybe in Europe or in the United States, um, many of our activism is in schools and going to schools. So during the pandemic, schools were closed, so we couldn't go to schools anymore. And also the challenge of you know students not having phones. But what we were doing was for those who could access phones, we were ensuring that you know we share most of the work that we were doing on social media through blog writing, through videos and also through sharing pictures of our climate strikes from our homes or our places for those you know who continue to work even during the pandemic yeah yeah and it's uh, it's also as a professor mentioned too it's it's sort of therapeutic uh when you feel isolated and alone and powerless getting out and working with like-minded folks on something tan tangible uh, it helps there's i believe it's professor chenoweth out of harvard who did this uh, paper on the three and a half percent rule. She studied nonviolent protest movements through history. And if they can get found that if you get three and a half percent of a population uh, behind something, they have twice as much chance of, of changing policies than violent protests. And in a country like the United States, that's only in quotes, nine million adults. Um, so you don't need, you know, everybody uh, in the streets every, every day. But actually, Professor Tina writes uh, a question, if it is a political duty for citizens to take action on climate change, what does this mean for citizens living under authoritarian uh, regimes? Uh, you know, the, a single party government like in China can decide to, to either build a solar field or a coal fired power plant, and they don't have mm -hmm. to mess with the politics that we have in the United States. But what about the people living in those countries who want to do something? Hmm. Well, it depends on, on we, in, in which country you live. In some countries, you can really do very little. Uh, you, you basically need to, to survive. But in other countries, even under authoritarian regimes, uh, there are areas where you can still take action, whether it's in the private sector of business, whether in the development of technology, whether it is in environmental policies. So uh, it's, it's, again, I, I each country is different in this respect in how much agency it allows uh, citizens to have. But usually, except in extreme cases, people still have agency. And it's, uh, it's very disheartening to tell them, no, you can't do anything. Actually, this is part of what sustains autocracies in the long run, that people get the feeling that they just have no agency at all. And it's not true. In, except for very extreme cases, people always have some measure of agency. 
and uh, learning what you can do and actually trying to do it over time, also uh, in addition to helping say environmental causes can also cause political change. Like in the 1980s, during the fall of uh, the process of the fall of communism, authoritarian communism in Eastern Europe, uh, many of the first organizations were environmental because this was something that was, you know, kind of between the cracks of the system that it could still be done. So there is a link there. And we should remember that in most cases, people have some measure of agency. Yeah. The, I, I, since I brought up China, I should also point out they managed to clean the air around Beijing in startling uh, amount of speed, given what, what people thought they were capable of just in the last few years. And a lot of it had to do with early social media protests and the fact that the decision makers were, were choking on the same air. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I think as, as the evidence of this crisis becomes more evident for a lot of people, um, some will be able to isolate and wall themselves off, but like I always say, sooner or later, we're all going to be climate reporters mm. <laughs> or climate activists, uh, like it or not. Um, Vanessa, when, when you talk to government officials in Africa, is how do they compare to the rest of the world, to the developed world, are, are dealing with this issue? Are you seeing, I know that the Green Belt Initiative it seems to be promising. Um, how goes things in your corner of the world? Well, I haven't spoken to any government official um, from Africa or from my country. And many times, of course, we ask ourselves if you know they're watching us or if they're seeing the work that we are doing. Or So we never really get any kind of specific response from them or hear anything from them. So we can't tell whether they're in support or you know, not in support of the work you know, that we are doing. Yeah, I think, but what I've really seen mainly with the young people in Africa, you know, it's just, it's beyond the climate strikes. Um, there, there is a lot of projects that are going on on ground in different communities. And I've seen this like with so many young African, you know, people working to you know bring water to their communities through uh, putting in place of fundraising for water harvesting you know te uh, techniques I've seen you know young Africans do uh, climate education and planting fruit trees in households and even me myself uh, working on a project of installing solar panels and eco-friendly cookstoves in schools, so that is, you know, that is something that I can talk about when it comes to the different activists in Africa. It is, it goes beyond, you know, the climate strikes, but actually running projects in their communities, you know, to transform their communities. It's great to hear sort of tangible examples. Uh, finally, we're, we're winding down towards the end here. I want to give you both just a, a chance to, to, to share final thoughts for those economic students and others interested out there. Um, mm -hmm. Words of advice, words of encouragement, uh, final thoughts. We'll start with you, Professor. Well, I'll just say that, I mean, we created the system under which we are now living and we created this problem. Uh, we can also fix it. The world, the way that the world runs, and if you're thinking if economics, the kind of laws of the economic system, they did not come down from heaven. They didn't, uh, they are not the laws of nature. Humans invented them. Uh, and humans can change them. That's our unique ability. And we need, we can do it. We don't have a lot of time, but it's still possible to change the, our priorities, to, to rewrite the rules of the game so that not just a tiny elite, but all the inhabitants of the planet will have a better future or let's, for, for starters, will have any kind of future. So I, think, I think for me, it's, you know, for people to 
really envision the kind of future that they want and to just imagine it and just have you know that vision and then to remember that it's one system and you know as we tackle the different parts of the system we actually you know end up manifesting that vision that we carry in our minds and in our hearts and also for people to know that another world is not only necessary for all of us but it's actually possible amen uh dr martin luther king said i have a dream not a nightmare he had a, he focused on the positives that we're capable of and it, and it goes a lot farther uh, I want to thank both of you so much for your time and thoughts uh, this morning. Uh, please keep up the good work in your respective endeavors. And I can't wait to see what both of you come up with next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. And thanks to all of you for joining us here at the Warwick Economic Summit. I'm Bill Weir of CNN. It's been a pleasure uh, hosting this panel, and I look forward to further conversations down the road. Thanks for joining us, everybody.